Hey guys and what's up, I'm CJ and welcome back to my galaxy. Today we're talking more about the Hunger Games and Sunrise on the Reaping. Last time I spoke about the Hunger Games on my channel, the last video on my channel before this, I was looking at the book cover reveal and a quote from Hamish Abernathy, we essentially got confirmation that the Sunrise on the Reaping is going to be from his perspective. But I did not include the synopsis because I didn't know that there was a synop synopsis and I couldn't find it. I didn't know where to get it. The only place that I can see that it is is on the Today, a Today news article, which I'm like looking down on my laptop once again. So as you can also see, the title of this video is about who the other female tribute is that Hamish went into the games with which we're going to be discussing today but I wanted to get through this synopsis article because obviously that's where we know that there's going to be talks about Hamish's um, other female tribute during his games like I said before other than Maisley Donna we know about Maisley Donna so I wanted to just to read the article and then what we're gonna do is read the excerpt from Catching Fire I have it just marked down here it's like nine pages long so basically this is going to be a lot of reading and I'm going to like put some infographics on over this video so as to like break up the reading a little bit so it's like not too overwhelming but it's like I think it's like nine ten pages long the point in Catching Fire where Katniss and Peter watch Hamish's games that's essentially all the information we get about the 50th Hunger Games so that's that from what we know seems to be kind of propaganda so we're gonna have to find more about more about that when sunrise on the reaping comes out but for now we're simply speculating so what is the speculation coming from how are we gonna speculate well i am going to be talking about the article let's read out the article i'm starting at the point i'm starting a little bit down just after in the today article and it's gonna be linked in the description as well after the cover and it's going to be here on the screen as well. So I'm gonna start reading it out. The spiky sun rises on a symbol that will come to mean a lot to Hamish Abernathy, uh, Abernathy as well as countless re readers. David Levithan, Le Levithan, Levithan, I'm sorry. Vice President, Publisher and Editorial Director for Scholastic said in a statement for today, artist Tim O'Brien has created yet another iconic Hunger Games cover. This one symbolically exploring one of the central themes of the series, how conflicting forces can be connected by common, their common nature, the songbird and the snake springing from the same source. Now from this, uh, this paragraph, I do believe that means that there's going to be another character really bouncing off the ideas of Hamish, that they are from two very different worlds, but there is something common bringing them together. And that's the idea of the games being extremely unethical. I do believe that the games or the snake, sorry, I completely lost my train of thought there. I think the snake is not going to represent snow in this cover from like, the, like in the way that sna the snake in Songbirds and Snakes represented snow. Some people said that sometimes it represented Lucy Gray because she like was able to control the snakes. I would argue she is the songbird. Um, I definitely see where people are coming from with that and there is definitely evidence and an argument behind it. However, I think that it's more about the fact that Lucy Gray, the songbird, can control snakes. But depending on where you're pulling the evidence from at different parts of the novels, it can definitely be understood as Lucy Gray is the snake but anyway we're getting distracted and a lot of people were speculating including myself that Plutarch was going to be this perspective for this 50th Hunger Games novel. I do believe that the conflicting force the one that is connecting with a central theme what is it called what they say the common nature uh is definitely going to have something to do with Plutarch because of the purple cover a lot of people are pointing out especially in my last video in the comment section, people were talking about the fact that purple represents the game makers. I personally don't remember that uniform being presented as purple. I remember Plutarch's colour being purple. And I'm going to have to rewatch the movies and reread the books now because I don't remember that. But thanks for letting me know. So yeah, I'm just thinking that that's definitely going to represent Plutarch and Haymitch. Or it's at least someone like Haymitch 
and a capital member or Hamish and Maisley, maybe, but who knows? Let's keep reading. Sunrise on the Reaping is set during the second quarter quell, aka the 50th annual Hunger Games, a fight to the death involving children from the country's districts for the entertainment of its capital citizens as a reminder of past failed rebellion. The book starts the morning of the reaping or the ceremony in which children from each district are picked to compete in the games. So this sunrise is definitely going to be like Haymitch and his girlfriend. That's at least what I think. Typically two children, one boy and one girl, are reaped from each district, but every 25 years, a special version of the games known as the Quarter Quell introduces a new twist. For the second Quarter Quell, there are twice as many children reaped and 48 kids are sent into the arena. Long-term fans of the original trilogy remember that District 12's Hamish Abernathy, who mentored Candice and Peter in the original trilogy, competed and won in the 50th Hunger Games. And he will indeed be the protagonist in this new book, Scholastic Shared, October 16th. So it is 100% confirmed that Hamish is going to be the perspective, the protagonist in this book. So it's not going to be like a Snow situation, a Snow, or like Lucy Gray's story being told from Snow's perspective. It's not going to be like Plutarch telling Hamish's story. It's not going to be someone else like Effie Snow telling Hamish's story or Maisley Donna, it's definitely going to be Hamish, which I know I was speculating and I thought that maybe it was going to be a bit repetitive and I'm still kind of worried it's gonna be repetitive, that it's gonna be a lot like Katniss, but it, if Susan Collins has done this right, and we know that Susan Collins is an amazing writer, if she's done it right, I do definitely think that the similarities with Hamish and Katniss will really work to her advantage in this book. I'm a little bit worried that it's going to be in third person and not first person because I've seen a lot of people saying maybe it will be but from the quote I can almost guarantee you it's going to be first person just because if it's from his perspective and he's saying I will not have the cap them take my tears as entertainment I can't remember the quote I'm sorry but it uses like first person pronouns so I think it's going to be in first person just personally. When Sunrise on the Reaping was announced in June, Collins said in a statement she was inspired by philosopher David Hume's implicit submission or, in his words, the easiness with which the many are governed by the few. Which I absolutely love that Susan Collins takes such big inspiration from different areas or in different fields. I just, I love that. Especially like ancient worlds, philosophers and different stories. She used the Lucy Gray poem from William Wordsworth. And I just love that. It's the best intertextuality that she could be using. And like as a literature student, a literature major, I'm like, <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Suzanne. So let's keep reading the article. The story also lent itself to a deeper dive into the use of propaganda and the power of those who can control the narrative. The question, real or not real, seems more pressing to me every day, she said, referring to a quote from Mockingjay, the third book in the original Hunger Games trilogy. Sunrise on the Reaping is Colin's second Hunger Games prequel novel. 2020's The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes was President Coriolana Snow's villain origin story and followed him as he mentored District 12's female competitor Lucy Gray Baird in the 10th annual Hunger Games. In The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, like the three original games books were adapted into a movie, the film hit theatres in November 2023 and starred Tom Blythe as Coriolana and Rachel Zegler as Lucy Gray. I want to say before what we were seeing as real or not real, that whole idea is really interesting that she's going to be bringing that back up with the whole propaganda theme and real or not real, I'm actually, I know it's like, <laughs> it's gonna be a tragic story for Hamish's games because we know how it turns out. However, real or not real, I'm so excited to see how that would play into Hamish's story. I just, I'm very excited to see that. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm like, I'm hyped, man. Let's get into the synopsis. Ready? Sunrise on the Reaping will revisit the world of Pan Am 24 years before the events of the Hunger Games. Star starting on the morning of the Reaping of the 50th Hunger Games, also known as the Second Quarter Quell. As the day dawns on the 50th annual Hunger Games, fear grips the districts of Pan Am. This year, in honor of the Quarter Quell, twice as many tributes will be taken from their homes. Back in District 12, Hamish Abernathy is trying not to think too hard about his chances. All he cares about is making it through the day and being with the girl he loves. 
which is so adorable. Just the side note is that Hamish is like, we're gonna see a Hamish Abernathy truly in love by the looks of it. I know it's probably gonna be a biased narrator, but by the looks of it, he's gonna be like in love with this girl. Like, I, I don't think I'm gonna be able to handle it knowing she ends up dead. I truly, I'm going to cry reading this novel. You know, like Snow Story, you know, there was like a bittersweet ending with Katniss and Peter. Snow Story, we knew that he had this villain origin story and we could see it coming and we empathized or not empathized, we empathized with Stojanus and Lucy Gray, but um, we understood Snow and how that happened, but I didn't necessarily, I cried a little bit at Stojanus' death, but other than that, it was more like a snow what are you doing no snow can we please choose the right to be good choose to be good even though i knew he wasn't going to be like Hamish, hey, it's gonna be like i can't do anything about it i can't like go into this world and change something because it's already happened and it, we know how it ends i'm just gonna let's let's just keep Reading. Okay, where was I up to? When Hamish's name is called, he can feel all his dreams break. He's torn from his family and his love, shuttled to the capital with the three other District 12 tributes. A young friend who's nearly a sister to him, a compulsive odds maker, and the most stuck up girl in town. As the games begin, Hamish understands he's been set up to fail, but there's something in him that wants to fight and have that fight reverberate far beyond the deadly arena. Now, when I immediately read these three different tributes that's being described, the only tributes name we actually end up getting in Catching Fire is that of Maisley Donna. We know Maisley Donna was the aunt of Madge Undersea, I think her name was, and Maisley was um, the original holder of the Mockingjay pin. Madge was the best friend, the real best friend, not like Gail. Gail was like, I want something out of this relationship because it, Gail is Gail. But Ma Madge was like the actual best friend of Katniss and gives her this pin in the book. When she's reaped, she goes and visits her in the justice building and says, will you put this, will you wear this pin in the arena, please? It's like a token, remember me, remember District 12, the yada yada, that whole thing that whole jazz and we know later on it's because in Catching Fire it was passed down from Maisley Donna and that's how Hamish presumably knew to trust and to kind of let like see that Katniss could fight like Maisley did in the arena. So Maisley Donna is one of the people and I've seen some people speculating that maybe it's the young friend who's nearly a sister to him and the stuck up girl in town. Um, compared to stuck up girl in town, but um, Maisley's the stuck up girl in town or the most stuck up girl in town, right? Because I, and let's remember this, I've made a video on this in the past, is the class division in District 12. It's massive. It's like they're creating, the capital creates all of this fighting within the districts to keep their power so they're not, they don't remember who the real enemy is. So they're fighting against each other. Uh, there's points in time where Katniss is saying that Peter grew up more privileged than him and it, it's not until she learnt more about Peter that it that she really realised that the merchants didn't necessarily have it any better than the seam. And we also know that at the very beginning, I believe in like literally the first chapter of uh, the first Hunger Games book, is that they go and sell strawberries to the mayor and his daughter Madge and Gail kind of picks on Madge a little bit that she's had a better life than him and we know that the merchant area is largely believed by the seam to be more well off in a way so the only reason the only way I can see Maisley being perceived by Hamish you know they were and I'll read the excerpt in a minute they were um kind of uneasy allies like they weren't like really friends until the end and how before Maisley died uh they were it was uneasy <laughs> and it's, she's definitely the only way I can see how much seeing Maisley before being raped is being stuck up and I don't see him being friends and almost just and almost like a sibling relationship with someone from the merchant area because we know Maisley was also from the merchant area because she was friends best friends with um, Katniss's mother, Mrs. Everdeen. Mrs. Everdeen came from the merchant area and married a seam man, a coal miner, which was like 
not something that people in District 12 did. So the sister, the young friend, almost like a sister to him, is going to be a seam girl that we don't know the name of. And just briefly before I read the excerpt, a compulsive odds maker is a really interesting description for like the other male tribute that was reaped. Um, the compulsive odds maker almost makes it seem like to me that he's going to try and manipulate his odds in some way. He's going to be calculating it. He's going to be like beady in a way, like try and calculate it and figure out the math and figure out all the science behind it, the, all the odds and, you know, trying to make sure he survives and he's the one that's going to survive. I imagine this compulsive odds maker is almost going to be rebellious in some way and he's going to be taken out early because of that. But I do think that these four tributes, including Hamish, are going to get a lot of, I'm, I want to say screen time, but it's a book. They're going to get a lot of time on the page and compared to Hamish you know, and all the other tributes, we're going to see a lot of these people because Hamish does know them. So I do think that it's going to be very interesting to see and find out what these tributes were like before going into the arena, unfortunately dying, just so Hamish could win. So. Now, before I discuss who really is um, this young girl, the other female tribute other than Maisley Donna, I want to read out this excerpt so it's easier for me to describe, uh, much easier for me to describe whereabouts I think this is going with the female tribute because I have, I do know that there's a comment section, there's a commenter in my comment section and I'll like leave the comment here or somewhere, right? That this commenter was talking about how they think that there's something a lot more treasonous that's been going on in this whole like world that Hamish, like the, in the tapes that Candace and Peter watched because why did he get his entire family killed? for throwing an axe in a force field when Katniss and Peter's families were still alive and well after the berry stunt. I know that Snow probably had to be really careful. However, I just don't see, after this commenter especially inspired this idea, I just don't see that being a possibility that the female tribute has to be here somewhere because if we're suddenly being told that he's really close with someone like a sister, then why didn't he ally with her? Why wasn't there a, an alliance here? Why did he go off on his own? I know even like Katniss who saw Rue, like Prim, like there was very big similarities between the two. There was this sister, sister-like figure in the arena that Katniss didn't want to come down to the final two with. So obviously she was trying to plan how she was going to get away with Rue and she didn't really want to think about it, but she still wanted to protect Rue and keep her from dying. And I imagine Hamish is going to be very much the same, that he's going to ally with this sister kind of character. And eventually she's going to end up dead and that's why. But I'm going to read the excerpt. I'm going to tell you where I, whereabouts I think that this young friend sister is going to be. I wonder if she's 12. Because they said young friend, implying that this friend has to be younger than Hamish in some way. Which is actually interesting. So I'm wondering if this is like a 12 year old and that's why Hamish like paid so much attention to Katniss because he realized that Prim was like the person he, oh my God, hang on a minute, guys. I just, oh my, oh my God, he lost his own Prim. Guys, did he lose his own Prim? Oh my. Let's read the excerpt, okay? Just before I start reading this excerpt, I did want to point out that Candace describes Snow as he looks younger, but just as repellent. And I just find that very intriguing. <laughs> and I wonder how they're going to depict him in the 50th Hunger Games. I'm very excited to see that. I hope they cast Donald Sutherland's son. Um, um, I really want that to happen. By the time we get to District 12, I'm completely overwhelmed by the sheer number of kids going to certain death. There's a woman, not Effie, calling the names in 12, but she still begins with ladies first. She calls out the name of a girl who's from the seam. You can tell by the look of her. And then I hear the name Maisley Donna. Now, I, this is the only time I believe, and as we call out the, the excerpt, call out, yeah. As we get more into the excerpt, I'll explain further, but this is the only time 
I believe, the girl from the seam, which I, I can't believe we didn't, I didn't see it earlier, that obviously Haymitch would have known this girl because she's from the seam and so is Haymitch. And there's a very obvious look about the seam is that they have like dark hair and gray eyes and so does Haymitch. So, and then they call out Maisley Donna and the only reason Maisley registers for Katniss is because she was friends with Mrs. Everdeen. Oh, I say, she was my mother's friend. The camera finds her in the crowd clinging to two other girls, all blonde, all definitely merchants' kids. I think that's your mother hugging her, says Peter quietly. And he's right. As Maylee Donna, Donna bravely it disengages herself and heads for the stage, I catch a glimpse of my mother at my age, and no one has exaggerated her beauty. Holding her hand and weeping is another girl who looks just like Maisley, but a lot like someone else I know too. Madge, I say. That's her mother. She and Maisley were twins or something, Peter says. My dad mentioned it once. That's another thing that I think is really important about Sunrise on the Reaping is that we're going to be getting a lot of the cast of the merchants, like Peter's father, um, Mrs. Everdeen, Madge's mother, um, probably the mayor's son who marries Madge's mother as well. Um, we're probably going to see any sort of connection Haymitch may have to Candace's father because they're both from the seam. So all the seam people kind of know each other because District 12 is really small. So if they're in the same grade at school and they do go to school, education sucks in Pan Am, but they still go to school. We are going to be seeing Haymitch likely interacting with Mr. Everdeen and then Maisley interacting with Mrs. Everdeen. So let's go on. I think of Madge's mother, M Mayor Undersea's wife, who spends half her life in bed immobilized with terrible pain, shutting out the world. I think of how I never realized that she and my mother shared this connection of Madge showing up in that snowstorm to bring the painkiller for Gail, of my mocking j pin and how it means something completely different now that I know that its former owner was Madge's aunt, Maisley Donner, a tribute who was murdered in the arena. Haymitch's name is called last of all. It's more of a shock to see him than my mother, young, strong, hard to admit, but he was something of a looker. His hair dark and curly, those gray seam eyes bright, and even then, dangerous. I absolutely love the description of Haymitch and that Candace is really reluctant to say that he was like attractive. So, <laughs> I absolutely love that and they so depicted him. Look, look, love Woody Harrelson and he could not, Haymitch could not have been embodied by anyone else other than Woody Harrelson. However, the dark curly brown hair, come on. Come on, we could have had a Hamish like that. I God, I hope they pretend that Hamish freaking dyed his hair 24 years later because I'm gonna need to see a dark curly haired boy in that arena. I just think it'd be adorable. Something of a look at, like, I just, I, I reckon that'd be just so cool to see. Come on, give us a little bit more diversity than the blondies we've seen in the Hunger Games so far. I'm gonna need you guys to forgive me for how I'm gonna say this next part because I've been trying to practice it, like, just now, and I cannot see it, say it this properly. I'm so sorry, this next line. Oh, Peter, you don't think he killed Maisley, do you? I burst out. I don't know why, but I can't stand the thought. You know, oh, Peter. Oh, Peter, you don't know. I just, I sounded so weird trying to have like a proper emotion in my voice. So I had to do it like kind of monotone because <laughs> it, it sounded odd. I do apologize. With 48 players, I'd say the odds are against it, says Peter. The chariot rides in which the District 12 kids are dressed in awful coal miners outfits and the interviews flash by. There's little time to focus on anyone, but since Haymitch is going to be the victor, we get to see one full exchange between him and Caesar Flickerman who looks exactly as he always does, in his twinkling midnight blue suit, only his dark green hair, eyelids, and lips are different. So, Haymitch, what do you think of the games having 100% more competitors than usual? Asks Caesar. Haymitch shrugs. I don't see that it makes much difference. They'll still be 100% as stupid as usual, so I figure my odds will be roughly the same. The audience bursts out laughing, and Haymitch gives them a half smile, snarky, arrogant, indifferent. He didn't have to reach far for that, did he? I say. Now it's the morning the games begin. We watch from the point of view of one of the tributes as she rises up through the tube from the launch room and into the arena. I can't help but give a slight gasp. Disbelief is reflected on the face of the players. Even Hamish's eyebrows lift in pleasure. Or they, they almost immediately knit themselves back into a scowl. I love that Hamish is just so like Katniss. 
I love that. <laughs> it's the most breathtaking place imaginable. The golden cornucopia sits in the middle of a green meadow with patches of gorgeous flowers. The sky is azure blue with puffy white clouds. Bright songbirds flutter overhead. By the way some of the tributes are sniffing, it must smell fantastic. An aerial shot shows the meadow stretches for kilometers, far into the distance, in one direction. There seems to be woods, and in the other, a snow-capped mountain. The one line that just caught me was the sky is azure blue, and I think the name is Barb Azure in the covey, I reckon. Susan Collins must really like azure blue, or azure, whatever that means, whatever colour. I would guess it would be azure blue. I don't know what azure means as a, like, a descriptive of a colour. I don't know what kind of blue that would be. Anyway. I don't, I, I'll have to look this that up after this, but any, anyway, I just, she just merely must love that colour. The beauty disorients many of the players, because when the gong sounds, most of them seem like they're trying to wake from a dream. Not Hamish though, he's at the cornucopia, armed with weapons and a backpack of choice supplies. He heads for the woods, before most of the others have stepped off their plates. 18 tributes are killed off in the bloodbath that first day. Others begin to die off and it becomes clear that almost everything in this pretty place, the luscious fruit dangling from the bushes, the water in the crystalline streams, even the scent of the flowers when inhaled too directly is deadly poisonous. Only the rainwater and the food provided at the cornucopia are safe to consume. There's also a large, well-stocked career pack of 10 tributes scouring the mountain area for victims. Hamish has his own troubles over in the woods where the fluffy golden squirrels turn out to be carnivorous and attack in packs, and the butterfly stings bring agony if not death. But he persists in moving forward, also always keeping the distant mountain at his back. Now this is where I begin my theory of the young female tribute that's almost like her sister to Hamish. When it was mentioned by this commenter that there was something more, far more treacherous going on that, to get Hamish's family killed, I believe at this point it must be cut out from Katniss's perspective. I like mispronounced, I'm sorry. I just said to me S's in that name. Katniss's perspective and Peter's the tapes that were already propaganda uh, that were done, I assume, edited. We know that they are edited by the Capitol because even Katniss is, states that. I said too many S's again. I'm sorry, it's very late. Um, so what ha is happening here is that, from my belief, is that the young female tribute right there next to Hamish and Katniss just doesn't know because it's been edited out this entire time. There's a pack of deadly squirrels, uh, which I find interesting. So maybe she was attacked at that point. Maybe Hamish is also paired off with the other male tribute. So there may be a trio to have their odds stacked against them. Remember the compulsive odds maker. That, so this guy is trying to put the odds in his favor, but he's the first one to be killed in the arena by these deadly pack of squirrels, maybe. And that's where the treacherous acts begin. And I don't know what these treacherous acts would be, but it's going to be something of him trying to keep this sister, this young friend alive in the same way Katniss and Peter are. So just keep that in mind as this excerpt, as I continue to read this excerpt. Maisley Donna turns out to be pretty resourceful herself. For a girl who leaves the cornucopia with only a small backpack, inside she finds a bowl, some dried beef, and a blowgun with two dozen darts. Making use of the readily available poisons, she soon turns the blowgun into a deadly weapon by dipping the darts in her lethal substances and directing them into her opponent's flesh. Also, poison being a weapon of choice, that is a parallel to snow. Four days in, the picturesque mountain erupts into a volcano that wipes out another dozen players, including all but five of the career pack. With the mountain spewing liquid fire and the meadow offering no means of concealment, the remaining 13 tributes, including Hamish and Maisley, have no choice but to confine themselves to the woods. Hamish seems bent on continuing in the same direction, away from the now volcanic mountain, but a maze of tightly woven hedges forces him to circle back into the centre of the woods, where he encounters three of the careers and pulls his knife. They may be much bigger and stronger, but Hamish has remarkable speed and has killed two when the third disarms him. That career is about to slit his throat when a dart drops him to the ground. Maisley Donna steps out of the woods. We'd live longer with two of us. Guess you just proved that, says Hamish, rubbing his neck. 
allies, Maisley nods, and there they are, instantly drawn into one of those packs you'd be hard pressed to break if you ever expect to go home and face your district. This is the point in time where there's definitely no other tributes that Haymitch might have allied with at the beginning. So, like I said before, the Skrills, I predict, take out the odds maker. That is the other male tribute. And then the career pack takes out this young friend. And that there is when the treasonous act, the biggest treasonous act comes up. Because what's next in this excerpt? Peter and Katniss. Just like Peter and me, they do better together. Get more rest, work out a system to salvage more rainwater, fight as a team, and share the food from the dead tributes packs. But Hamish is still determined to keep moving on. Hamish is kind of mixed in with the idea of Peter and Katniss being like the out of the alliance with Hamish and Maisley, right? So this whole like thing is parallel to one another. But I believe, and he's like very hell bent on keeping and just continuing to move. And I, I'm not convinced this is Hamish's plan. I think this is something he wanted to do for this young tribute sister friend relationship. And I, I know this, there's no other tribute at this point because Maisley says uh, we'd be better with the two of us. So, I, I mean, they can always manipulate what she said because, you know, with the Jabba Jays, they do get screams of prim. So there are ways for them to receive footage and manipulate their words. However, I doubt it. I think that this hellbent plan on Hamish continuing to move towards the force field is something that was brought up by his previous alliance that we don't see anything of in the Catching Fire. So it's going to be that of the male or female tribute, likely the female tribute that he's listening to and he wants to continue to listen to past her death. At the end of the day, how exactly is Hamish taking on three career tributes? on his own. Canis says he's got a lot of speed, but that could have been manipulated by the capital. I think that there was another tribute there. And I don't think the, I think I sincerely believe that it is going to be a little bit funny if this is true, but I'm sure that's not what Susan Collins would want. But um, It's going to be, no, it won't be funny. It will be ironic that the male tribute, I believe would die early because he's so hell bent on this, like trying to manipulate the odds. So he dies trying to manipulate the odds in his favor, continuing this alliance and being in a three alliance compared saying like the career pack is huge. We need to like strengthen numbers and that's going to be his whole thing. He's going to die early on and Haymitch is going to be trying to protect a stutter. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> a stutter today. Oh my God. And it's going to be protecting this young friend that I at this point, I truly believe this is going to be a 12 year old little girl. That's like a sister to him. I truly, truly believe that. And she's gonna die at the hands of this career pack. And Maisley's gonna see that and they probably cut out Maisley discovering this and this fight and her staying back while this whole ordeal is going on and her only appearing once Hamish is taking out the career pack, essentially for her. I'm going to read the rest of the excerpt. So it's not too much to do with the theory, but I'm going to like talk a little bit about the theory after this, um, about the female tribute. But I think it's important to read the rest of this excerpt for those of you who have only watched the movies and haven't read the books, because this is not in the movies. This whole excerpt, not at all, which is why I'm reading out the entire thing, because I want you guys to consider the entirety of what we have from Katniss and Peter's, Peter's perspective and that biased narration and the fact that it's bringing up propaganda and the themes of Sunrise and the Reaping. I need you to consider it all together <laughs> and the perspective and what we have thus far about the perspective compared to what we will eventually get from Hamish's point of view. Why? Maisley keeps asking and he ignores her until she refuses to move any further without an answer. Because it has to end somewhere, right? Says Hamish. The arena can't go on forever. What do you expect to find? Maisley asks. I don't know. Maybe there's something we can use, he says. When they finally do make it through the impossible hedge, using a blowtorch from one of the dead career packs, they find themselves on flat dry earth that leads to a cliff. Far below, you can see jagged rocks. That's all there is, Hamish. Let's go back, says Maisley. No, I am staying here, he says. All right, there's only five of us left. May as well say goodbye now, anyway, she says. 
I don't want it to come down to you and me. Okay, he agrees. That's all. He doesn't offer to shake her hand or even look at her, and she walks away. Also important to note that um, Haymitch d thinks that she's the most stuck up girl. That's why I think this like whole point right here that he's a very reluctant ally with Maisley. He's only doing like strength and numbers. The whole that whole thing is because Haymitch um, thinks she's stuck up and she's a merchant girl, so he doesn't really care until this next bit. Hamish skirts along the edge of the cliff as if trying to figure something out. His foot dislodges a pebble and it falls into the abyss, apparently gone forever. But a minute later, as he sits to rest, the pebble shoots back up beside him. Hamish stares at it, puzzled, and then his face takes on a strange intensity. He lobs a rock the size of his fist over the cliff and waits. When it flies back out and right into his hand, he starts laughing. That's when we hear Maisley begin to scream. The alliance is over and she broke it off, so no one could blame him for just ignoring her. But Hamish runs for her anyway. He arrives only in time to watch the last of a flock of candy pink birds equipped with long, thin beaks skewer her through the neck. He holds her hand while she dies, and all I can think of is Rue and how I was too late to save her too. Later that day, another tribute is killed in combat and a third gets eaten by a pack of those fluffy squirrels, leaving Hamish and a girl from District 1 to vie for the crown. Interesting to note, right here, that it is possible for these squirrels to eat one of the tributes, and it's happened and Katniss is relaying that information to us. So how else did they find out those squirrels were dangerous? I'm just saying, one of them ate Hamish's alliance. I'm just, I'm just saying. She's bigger than he is and just as fast. And when the inevitable fight comes, it's bloody and awful, and both have received what could well be fatal wounds when Hamish is finally disarmed. He staggers through the beautiful woods, holding his intestines in, while she stumbles after him, carrying the axe that should deliver his death blow. Hamish makes a beeline for his cliff and has just reached the edge when she throws the axe. He collapses on the ground and it flies into the abyss. Now weaponless as well, the girl just stands there, trying to staunch the flow of blood pouring from her empty eye socket. She thinks perhaps that she can outlast Hamish, who's starting to convulse on the ground. But what she doesn't know, and what he does, is that the axe will return, and when it flies back over the ledge, it buries itself in her head. The cannon sounds, her body is removed, and the trumpets blow to announce Hamish's victory. Peter clicks off the tape, and we sit there in silence for a while. Finally, Peter says, That force filled at the bottom of the cliff. It was like the one on the roof of the training centre. The one that throws you back if you try to jump off and commit suicide. Hamish found a way to turn it into a weapon. Not just against the other tributes, but the capital too, I say. You know, they didn't expect that to happen. It wasn't meant to be part of the arena. They never planned on anyone using it as a weapon. It made them look stupid that he figured it out. I bet they had a good time trying to spin that one, but that's why I don't remember seeing it on television. It's almost as bad as us and the berries. I can't help laughing, really laughing, for the first time in months. Peter just shakes his head like I've lost my mind, and maybe I have, a little. Almost, but not quite, says Hamish from behind us. I whip around, afraid he's going to be angry over us watching his tape, but he just smirks and takes a swig from a bottle of wine. So much for sobriety. Now this last part of the excerpt is, I feel, with Hamish saying almost, but not quite, like the berries, is that he knows that there's something more to what he did. And that there's something more about the sister and that perhaps that he rebelled because of this very sibling bond that he had with another tribute and that the rebellion, like I've stated before in another video and a lot of the fandom talks about it before, is that Rue was the true Mockingjay. So Katniss rebelled technically for Rue. Rue was the start of the rebellion, so Hamish and his treacherous act was with the start of the rebellion. He started with the rebellion because of this young girl that he, that was like a sister to him. So I'm just saying, he knows, but he's, it's not quiet. This part may, the ax being just as bad as the berries. Yeah, maybe, but there's more to the story and there are far more similarities that we're gonna find out about Katniss and Hamish in Sunrise and the Re on the Reaping. I truly, 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 truly believe that the young female tribute was allied with Hamish this entire time and then we just didn't know because they cut her out of the clip. I just want to point out that Katniss 
does not mention the death of the other two District 12 tributes. Why? Because it wasn't shown. At some point, she just saw them in the sky when they announced it on, in the tapes, in the sky that Hamish would have seen with the fallen tributes. They would have mentioned it. She would have seen that and moved on thinking they died. The, the District 12 often has unfortunate circumstances that they're starving. They're weak because of the way they're treated by the capital. They're oppressed. So District 12 just doesn't have the odds. But you know, the thing is, the thing is, if she just assumed that and she's our biased narrator and suddenly we're finding out that there was a significant, there was some sort of significance with the other female and male tributes and Katniss didn't mention it, that means they were cut out of the tapes. But for what reason? It's because of the a treacherous act and that they allied with her and there's something similar to Rue in this, in this. In, in Sunrise on the Reaping. Hamish and this young female tribute, this young female tribute is Rue, is Prim, and I cannot reiterate enough, was the start of Hamish's part of the rebellion, Hamish's own rebellion, Plutarch's part of the rebellion. That was maybe the start of the rebellion we see in Mockingjay. And it's going to be this young girl that we don't know much about yet. So there's some speculation in the fandom because we know that the reapings are rigged, that the Hunger Games has this quota almost of how many, what kinds of tributes, how many tributes, whatever, right? Uh, how many tributes are of a certain age and that the quota includes at least like one 12 year old and that's how like Rue was in it, Prim was reaped, etc. So what if that quota is being met by Hamish's young friend? So. I would believe, yes, that there's somewhere in here going to be like a 12, really young 12 year old that everyone's going to be like crying over and that's going to be the most devastating death. I just know it. And I just, this female friend, this like little female tribute, the baby, the baby that I know for a fact is going to be 12 or really young. I'm, I'm calling it right now. She's going to be 12. Um, I've said that throughout this video. She's going to be 12 and like Prim and Rue and we're all going to cry and we're all gonna be on social media just bawling our eyes out. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say it, but we will be. And yeah, it, Hamish's young friend, sister almost, is going to be an ally early in the games and she's been cut out of these tapes, including the compulsive odds maker. I'm telling you right now, and they're avoiding Maisley because they're all from the seam. I don't know, they didn't mention that the odds maker was from the seam, but I'm, I'm speculating, yes. I'm gonna say he's from the seam as well and Hamish is just finds him annoying and is like low-key maybe kind of glad he died early on to the squirrels. So how else? Once again, how else did they figure out the squirrels were deadly? You know, strength in numbers. I don't believe that Hamish thought that he was going to survive on his own, especially if we know that there was like a, someone like a sister to him that he feels like he needs to protect. So that is it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Let me know your theories for Sunrise on the Reaping down below. How hyped are you for the new novel? How hyped are you for the synopsis that we got in the book cover? I'm super hyped. I can't wait to have a conversation with you guys in the comment section down below. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. It really helps out this channel. But once again, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video, but I have been CJ and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.